to start off, pretty dense question, but something that we've written about, you've written about quite a bit, on the topic of amenorrhea, that's the loss of the period, of your period or regular menstrual cycle, and basically it was more of a request than a question, but address the myth that girls only lose their period due to low body fat, and what's a girl to do? Do you want me to discuss this? Uh, yeah, so first of all, we're not doctors. Well, you might be someday. I say might. Yeah, this um, is not medical advice. It's not medical advice. You actually do need to talk to a medical practitioner about all this stuff. So this is just kind of like, these are points that you should think about. Yeah. That's that disclaimer out of the way. Um, but to answer the question, it's actually a really easy question to answer. Like, as a, as a scientist, you're you're always limited by your ability to ask good questions, right? And what I mean by that is, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? So when, when you go about researching a topic or actually trying to look deeper into a topic, you're gonna be presented with information that you can assess and essentially make it in your head look like, or you can think essentially that a certain thing is causative rather than correlative, right? And what I mean by that is, you can look at things that happen together, right? And you can go, oh, well, this thing obviously caused this other thing because in this population we look at, this process happens and then this event happens. So you can go, this happens, then this happens. And in your everyday life, in your everyday thinking, you would go, that makes sense that this causes this, you know? If, like, it's, it's like a domino effect. You know, you're like, okay, well, this is what happens. If I touch this domino, down the line, this happens, right? And that's that's essentially where this myth, we'll say, came about. Because you would have people that would have l low body fat and they would get amenorrhea, right? And that could be in people that are athletes, for example. That could be in people that are, you know, just dieting to look better. It could be in people that are you know, competitors, that, that's a, a very prevalent one. Again, you would then go, okay, that's further bolstering my hypothesis because these people get even leaner than all the rest of them and it appears that they get it more often than the rest. So you're like, there, I have my, my hypothesis, I have my data that supports this and I'm concluding that this causes this, right? But you then get presented with other data points and you have to then think a little bit deeper you have to look into the topic from a different angle right and one of these data points that essentially refutes that and actually points to better theories is the fact that people who undergo like gastric bypass surgery get amenorrhea mm -hmm. right so they could easily be 40, 50% body fat, you know, like obese, like clinically obese, like really down the road with that where it's like you, you weigh 400 pounds and like you need to lose weight or like serious health that complications are going to occur, right? So they get gastric bypass surgery and then amenorrhea occurs, right? So they still have the, the high body fat. That hasn't gone down yet. It may be going down, but the, the body fat itself is still high, right? and they're getting amenorrhea. So that, that kind of invalidates your first hypothesis, which is, okay, well, is, is it low body fat that's causing it? Or is it the process of getting low body fat that's causing it? And that's, that's the current hypothesis. Low energy availability leads to amenorrhea, right? Because you get down regulation of, we'll call them signaling hormones, you know, like lower insulin levels, lower thyroid, that kind of stuff, right? And all as a consequence of dieting. So it's not necessarily the low body fat that's causing it, it's the low energy availability that's causing it. So the processes you undertake to get to low body fat, that's, that's causing it, right? And this is then obviously going to be exacerbated if you are undertaking more extreme processes. You know, like if you are on a 500 calorie diet, you know, and that, that's all you're eating. Like that's, you're more likely then to get amenorrhea or menstrual cycle irregularities even if your body fat is still high right and like it's a it's a little bit hard to tease out some of the nuances because 
obviously if you have body fat to lose, you still have energy available to your body because that's what body fat is being used as. Well, that's not technically true, but that is true. Um, you're using that body fat as energy, as an energy source for the body. And as a result, you aren't necessarily in an energy deficit. You are actually in an energy deficit because you're not eating as much and your activity presumably is staying the same. But your body is actually making up the difference in the energy that it needs by using your body fat, you know? So you still do have the energy. So this is where the, the nuance comes about and you really have to dive in deep to the particulars of the individual themselves because all of these variables play into it. And just going like, oh, you're on a 500 calorie deficit, that means you're going to get menstrual uh, cycle irregularities. That's not necessarily true for you as an individual. So you'll see people that are we'll say more protected from this kind of stuff. You will see them not get these irregularities. Yeah. And as a result then go, yeah, well, well that's obviously not the case. This is not the diet. I can prescribe this kind of large deficit to other people and they should be fine. I mean, that's not necessarily the case for that individual. So there is a huge amount of individual variability to this, but once you understand that it's actually the processes that you have to undertake to lose body fat rather than your body fat level that dictates whether this will happen then you can start making better protocols you can start thinking about this issue in a better way now there are other variability or variables that go into this such as stress sleep recovery you know training volume but they all kind of feed into that energy availability hypothesis you know and uh, the stress and stuff that like, gets somewhat through different mechanisms but it, it does play into it but uh, yeah, I think that covers everything. But well, we still have to deal with what, what's the girl to do about it. So do you have anything to add before we get to that? Yeah, no, I think I think it's a super super point really just to, to clarify like that it that there is a distinct difference between like low energy availability and one's actual body fat because like you said they do always go together. But if you think of it from the perspective of someone who has lost their period and they're at a higher level of body fat, that can often be very disempowering because yeah. I've heard those stories of women who've you know, lost, their lost their menstrual cycle or the regularity to it and gone to their doctor, but because they're maybe overweight or whatever, their doctor's just like, oh yeah, this, this isn't due to diet because mm -hmm. you're not lean enough. So it is really important to, to understand that distinction there. And then the other point you touched on that I think was important was, I guess the difference between surviving and thriving in that like if you've got a lot of extra body fat and you just don't eat, like yeah, that fuel, that's there to be used for fuel, but your body is still able to quote unquote sense some sort of threat and the signaling processes that, don't, that, that go on then are going to reflect that. So you could have more aggressive metabolic adaptation than someone who is really lean while you're overweight because of very large relative energy deficiency. Mm. So if you're like someone who is, is let's say, 40 pounds overweight versus some arbitrary number, and you go into a 1200 calorie deficit or something like that, then you're gonna adapt you know, quite a bit to that. You're the, the, the different signaling processes, the endocrinology, etc., is gonna reflect that, even though you have plenty of fat that's there for fuel. So there's a very distinct difference there between what it takes to survive, because like, yeah, you're not gonna die, you've got the fuel there, and what it takes to actually thrive in that, you know, what it takes to, to feel well, to have everything running smoothly. So there's, there's very distinct differences there. And then I suppose in terms of like, what, what's a girl to actually do in this case? Like, just before we go on yeah. to that, you also mentioned as well, like this can be very disempowering, but people can also play this off as not being an issue. Yeah. And you see that a lot where it's like, oh, it's, you just lost your period. Like it's fine. Like it's actually, yeah. it's, it's less of a stressor now. I don't have to fucking, buy all this material to deal with that and I also just don't have to deal with that myself don't have to think about it like that's fine it's cool but you have to remember especially if you are in your teens and 20s like it's a very important process like you're actually laying down bone density yeah. right now as a, as a result of these hormonal fluctuations here and that's to do you for the rest of your life you know that's not to say that you can't lay down like bone density later in life, especially if you see people do like, a, they take up resistance training when they're in their 40s or whatever, and then obviously their bone density goes up and everything. But it's a very important time, especially if you are not really actively engaged in resistance training at, the, at this time, you know? But 
you have to keep it in your head that while yes dealing with your period may be a bit of a stress and you're just like the fucking hack of this like uh, i'd rather not have it like you do actually want to have it for all the the health accessory health benefits yeah, yeah. to it or whatever you want to call them um so if that is a thought process that you're engaged in you need to kind of just take a step back and go okay i actually need to think long term and like while it may be fine that i just don't have to deal with this rather annoying inconvenience for three to five days every month you might be like okay i'm actually just going to step back from that thought process and go this is actually something that i need in terms of my health long term so take that as well into, yeah. into consideration yeah because i did actually have a client once who was in that thought process because you know she had been to her doctor and the main discussion was you know, or worried, well, do you want to have kids? And she was like, no, I have no interest in having kids. Mm. And the take home point was, oh, you don't need to worry about this. Mm. So her, her thought process for the year or two following that was that I don't need to worry about the fact that I don't have a period because I don't want kids. Whereas like, I, would, I wouldn't view it as like an independent thing. I'd view it as a signal of what's actually going on in mm. your physiology. And like you alluded to, the bone density thing is, is super, super important because as you get older, as you move into menopause and postmenopause, um, or, or that time period in general, as you begin to age as a woman, like osteoporosis is something that can really take away from your quality of life. Like one of the, the, the most prominent examples of that is like elderly people who have like hip fractures. If you fall and like fracture the neck of your femur, like that's pretty much the end for you a lot of the time. As in the death like rate. If that was a horse, you'd shoot it. Yeah. Like, the, like you, the, you're immobile now, essentially. Yeah, the mortality rates after that are, are like very significant. Um, and just restoring your normal function is going to be very, very difficult. So you definitely don't want to be putting that stuff off for decades. You want to be thinking of it now because like you're going to regret it otherwise, essentially. And also, just on top of that, obviously, if you are thinking about getting pregnant in the future, like the... Yeah. the the better you can keep your fertility in a good place, obviously the easier you would hope that would be. I'm not going to say that it's a definite, but you would assume or you would think that it would be easier to go about that process if you have been looking after your cycle, if you've been looking after your reproductive health all along. Whereas if you're just like, yeah, now sometimes like I just go into this huge deficit and I just lose my period for like two years at a time. It's like, well, to get pregnant then, like you have to then recover that and get that back into a good place if you're trying to like plan like do some family planning like obviously you know random events can occur and you know uh but if you if you are looking to get pregnant have a family in the future like that is it is something you need to be thinking about now rather than going like oh, i'll deal with that when it comes to it you know yeah um, and what else was i just gonna say there oh yeah in terms of like this advice like obviously there, there's there's nutritional and training considerations that are important but you also have to still consult with your doctor because it could be that this is just reflecting some other disease process that's mm -hmm. ongoing or something else that could be treated very simply. So you still do, still do have to go down that, that, that process because some people just think that all oh, because they went to their doctor once and they got no help that they just need yeah. to find the nutrition solution and that's it. Whereas that's definitely not always the case. Yeah. And also I just, I never understand like, first of all, like you can have an argument about the, the healthcare system and say that, you know, their first line protocol is like, oh, here's the pill. Yeah. And that's not actually so sorting out the, the underlying issue, right? But, you know, we live in a, a democratic society. Like, any first world country, like you, well, most first world countries, you have the ability to go, okay, well, I don't actually like that advice. I'm going to go get a second opinion. I'm going to go to a different doctor. I'm going to... You know go to a specialist you know maybe you have to be on a wait list for fucking two years and or whatever in ireland or you know any country that has like socialized medicine but at least you can go get that you know so don't don't just go oh this is the the one piece of advice i didn't like it so i'm just writing off the medical you know healthcare stuff so, like that's like going to your mechanic your, your car has a warning light on the mechanic goes yeah I, I don't know how to fix this and you just go right i'm just going to drive with the, the warning light on forever now it's like Okay, well, there's clearly an issue here. Let's let's go to someone who does know how to fix this or does know how to help you in a way that you find acceptable, you know? But the, the last part of that is, like, what's a girl to do? Well, like, it's actually pretty straightforward. Just eat more, yeah. right? Which, you know, that's that's helpful advice, but also just extremely unhelpful because it's like, well, I fucking have goals. I want to have a six-pack. I want to yeah. do whatever, you know? I have a, a weight class for you know, whatever it is. But that's an issue of you actually setting 
and accomplishing the actual goals that you have, you know, like prioritizing your goals. Like if you're like, I, I'm going to be competing in the Olympics in two years time and I need to qualify in these competitions and I need to be a, at a certain weight. It's like, that may be more important to you than your health, you know, like, and that's, that's a trade off you have to make, you know, if you think that getting a six pack and doing it your way, dieting on the lower, lower calories. And this, this is also something that you have to take into account. Even if you do everything right, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be exempt from this, no. you know, like I think people need to think, take a, a longer time period view of this where it's like, okay, you might lose it if you do a 12 week diet, but you can then like kind of reverse edit that a little bit, spend some time at, you know, kind of maintenance calories, recover your, your, your cycle, and then, you know, maybe do a dieting period again and like get to the level of leanness or body composition that you're happy with over two to five years rather than 12 weeks, you know, which a lot of people aren't willing to actually do. It's like, oh, I have a holiday in three months, so let's go for this. You know, it's like, you have to be thinking that long-term approach. So keep, keep that in mind. But essentially you have to do a, a priority checklist or whatever you want to call it, where it's like, these, these are my priorities. I've actually laid these out. Like is health at the forefront? Because a lot of people say that, but then do things that are fundamentally dichotomous to that, you know? So you, you actually have to sit down with yourself and think wh what you're actually trying to accomplish and where your priorities lie, you know? So it's, it's not helpful, but you know, eat more or yeah. do less. That, that's also the other side of the, the calorie equation. Like if you're training twice a day, six days per week, you know, you're like, oh, I do my hour cardio in the morning and my resistance training in the evening. It's like, okay, well, like this is one segment of the, the energy availability stuff. If you're using all this energy towards training and recovering from training, you know, you either have to eat more to support that, or you can just reduce your training volume and as a result have higher calorie availability, you know? So a little bit of both sides of the, the equation in terms of training and nutrition, you just have to assess what you're actually doing. Yeah, and it, it's a tough process as well. Like, and I've, I've, we've seen that with a number of our clients where like, you know, you have some people who you know, maybe they notice some irregularities and they miss a period like at the end of their diet, but then once they get back to maintenance, it's like, it's just normal again. But then you have other people who just take much longer to, to regulate again. And you see a number of case reports related to bodybuilding as well. There was one case report, I think, where one, one female competitor who had competed in, I think, the female physique division, it took her something like 18 months or mm -hmm. something like that to, to regain a regular cycle. And I mean, that's a long time and that's something that's difficult to commit to so like in that case where you're you're in it for the long run like working with a coach or a medical professional nutritional nutrition professional someone who can guide you on the path is probably a good idea um, because that's something that's difficult to commit to um, yourself because I, I kind of view that in a similar manner to how I view people undergoing like post-surgical rehab like for example people who Get, uh, rupture their ACL and have to have ACL reconstruction and they were previously like excellent athletes they have to invest a long time of just going through boring stuff that doesn't necessarily align with their like what they feel they should be doing and this is very similar where you might have had a fat loss goal all along and especially if you've never reached it you're now at a point where you're committing to over consuming calories at least probably over consuming for potentially three, six, 12 months. And that's really something that's difficult to deal with psychologically. So I could definitely appreciate that. And in that case, like if that was me, what I would be trying to do is have some sort of goal that I can work on alongside that. Mm. For example, it could be setting specific strength goals in the gym, because that's something you're very likely to progress quite a bit with if you're working um, on, over, on over consuming calories and sufficiently fueling your training. And um, what you don't want is to take up marathon running <laughs> or something that's going to drastically reduce your energy availability again. And that's not to say you can't work yeah, on like, like fitness goals. Course, yeah. You know, you just have to be like manage your overall training volume. Yeah. You know, you just have to be more aware of what you're actually trying to do. You know? Yeah. Like there was one case I had of a, a woman who she had been through years of like a we'll call it yo-yo or binge dieting, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, back and forth, if she had like a huge deficit, then she'd blow out a huge deficit. And she was doing that for about, we'll say three years, you know? And 
it took us working together for two years. Like our body fat wasn't even that low. Like it was relatively low compared to the average population, we'll say, you know? But you wouldn't be like, oh man, she's absolutely shredded, you know? But through years of doing this like yo-yo dieting, like she was just completely dysregulated. And it took us two years to actually get into a regular cycle. Like she would have periods of time where it was like, oh, I got my period back. And then she wouldn't have it for the next three, four months, you know? Yeah. And it was like, we, we were working on stress management, sleep, you know, obviously the food aspect, keeping training volume at uh, an acceptable level that still allowed her to feel like she was working and moving towards her goals. But all that stuff had to be managed and it still took us two years. You know, like obviously, again, there's intermittent times where it's like, oh, I got two together, you know, but to really get it back on track monthly, it took us two years. And her, her ultimate goal was to continue building her family, I suppose you'd say. Like, she already had two kids, so she wanted to have, I think she wanted to have ultimately four kids, but uh, it, that was her goal. And she was like, well, I actually need to start moving towards that. And yeah. like, I, I can't be doing it if my cycle is just completely irregular, you know? But uh, yeah, I think that covers everything yeah the only final thing i would say is that i'm mindful that some of our listeners are quite young so if you're listening to this and you're like 20 or something and you're like fuck it i don't want kids like <laughs> take more time to think about that before you're just like oh i don't need a period or a menstrual cycle and um, because you know you might regret that when you're older but yeah that's we're definitely not the best people to <laughs> advise about family planning well, i definitely am my family just have huge families so <laughs> there's no planning involved yeah. Um, so yeah, let's go on to the next question.